for uh, critical long day. Uh, it is a question dedicated to, to RDS. So my name is Claude Pierre. I'm an intensivist in Lyon, France, and I have an academic position, and I'm a director of a 20 bed IC, medical ICU. And my research activities are focused on mechanical ventilation and ERDS, and also prone position and respiratory mechanics. So according to the, the rules of this event, I have to make a very short introduction to the topics. As you know, ERDS this year is 50 years in age, but it is still a, a very serious illness that accounts for almost by 10% of ICU admissions and, and supports the mortality rate between 30 to 40 percent, according to the most recent data from the uh, lung safe study. Um, the large majority of earth patients require invasive mechanical ventilation. And as intensivists, what we have to do is first to identify the ERDS and then to disclose the, co the cause of ERDS to carry out appropriate treatments and then to set the ventilator properly. Indeed, we have no treatment active against the pathological process. So having said that, it's time to turn to the three speakers involved in this session. Each of them has 12 minutes to deliver the talk. After the, the third talk, we have a couple of minutes open to questions you may have to the speakers together with a panel of experts. So send us your questions during the talk through the WebEx system. And we have to close the session in uh, something like uh, and now uh, 8 p.m. or something. So the first speaker is Theogen Twadjuri Moga from Rwanda. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Who is going to talk about do we need an ERDS definition? So welcome to Theogen. You have 12 minutes for, for delivering your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Kirim. Uh, as you said, my name is Eugen Tuagiru Mugabe, and I'm uh, working at the University of Rwanda in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Medicine. And I have been uh, given this opportunity to talk about ILDS and on the uh, point of whether we need a new or another alternative definition. So first of all, I have to disclose that there is no conflict of interest to give this talk. And my talk will be a little bit uh, on uh, three major points. I will start with uh, a historical background of IADS definition. And then I will raise some issue with the current definition, the Berlin definition that we have. And also I will end up by giving a kind of proposition, a potential universally applicable definition that need to be uh, considered invalidated. As you did mention, the LDS is known since almost 50 years now from the first uh, description of uh, this severe hypoxemic uh, syndrome as uh, an adult respiratory distress uh, described among 12 cases by Ashbo and colleagues. At the beginning, it was limited to adult, given that the future was a little bit to the uh, hearing membrane disease of neonates, but later on, since the disease concerned both pediatric and adult cases, it has been named as acute respiratory distress syndrome and have been defined by the American and European consensus uh, conference. The major four points, that the timing, which was uh, an acute onset, but not very well defined. A bilateral infiltration on the chest x-ray and also the hypoxemia characterized by the ratio uh, PaO2 and FiO2 and in this definition they were dividing uh, the ARDS into two entities the acute lung injury and uh, the RDS per se but the definition did not talk into consideration the uh, application of uh, 
and respiratory positive pressure. And in that definition, also they were excluding uh, a cardiac, cardiogenic origin of the bilateral infiltrate by having a mandatory uh, the capillary edge pressure below 18 millimeters of mercury or absence of evidence of left atrium hypertension. So those different uh, are raising a lot of issues that have been addressed the Berlin definition that came up in 2012 by uh, the European uh, Society of uh, Intensivists and the acute onset we've been defined that to, uh, the insert should come, the earliest should become within one week after the first uh, risk factor and the chest x-ray should show the bilateral opacity uh, not explained by pre-refusion or telectasis or any future of mass and uh, the severity of the hypoxemia was defined into different stages uh, from uh, 200 to 300 and between 100 and 200 and less than 100 and in that definition the acute lung injury was excluded into the in, from the definition and uh, in this definition there was also a, an application at least of a minimum of peep of, of five centimeters of water but despite the practicality and the explicit pattern of this definition different issues are still being raised with these uh, Berlin definitions and the previous one as well. Because in this definition, although the severity of the disease can uh, guide somehow on the uh, ventilatory strategy, but the definition doesn't lead to uh, a specific treatment to any form of the ALDS. Whereas in the recent studies, it has been shown that the ALDS can be uh, divided into uh, two major classes that have been named subphenotypes uh, thanks to the uh, latent class analysis studies that has been conduct have been conducted on uh, three major cohort of ALDS patient, namely ARMA, alveoli, and uh, FACPC uh, trials. In those uh, studies, they have identified different classes according to the uh, inflammatory and bio biological markers together with uh, clinical and uh, etiological uh, entities of the LDS. And the phenotype, the phenotype 2, have shown that the mortality could have been resu is reduced when there is a, a conservative fluid management applied and also when a high PEEP is applied. Whereas in previous studies, those different trials didn't show any difference at all. With regard to the subphenotype 1, the the prognosis or the effect looks a little bit uh, opposite to the previous one. And I think if this is uh, happened to be proved, uh, those different subclass or subphenotypes should be included in the uh, definitions to come by different experts. But this is not the main uh, focus of this presentation because on um, uh, this was limited setting perspective, the Berlin definition is not applicable almost at all. As you may see, the ratio P and F ratio is only possible when you have the arterial blood gas and the PEEP uh, and the uh, the PEEP can only be uh, uh, you, uh, used if you have access to ventilator or if you have access to the 
ICU bed, which is not possible in many uh, different settings in low and middle income countries, but also the definition of the Berlin definition doesn't apply also on uh, patients who are not yet admitted in the ICU, mainly, uh, namely patients who are not yet uh, ventilated. So that is why in our uh, one of the university teaching hospitals in Rwanda, we try to evaluate the importance of the LDS among uh, patients who are admitted in in that hospital. But using using the Berlin definition, it was almost impossible to have uh, an idea on at which extent the LDS is important. Then we tried to see if we can. Uh, make some substitutes to those uh, different pieces of the IRDS definition by the Berlin. And we found out that in the literature, the PF should can be substituted by the, the peripheral pulse oximetry uh, uh, SPO2 and FiO2. Uh, which has been supported by a study that has been conducted by Rice and uh, co-authors published in 2007 and with they have found a kind of linear relationship between those two and by taking into consideration this linear relationship between the SPO2 FiO2 ratio and PFI2 ratio we can draw a kind of cutoff for the definition of the IRDS. Uh, 300 will become 315. And without uh, needing the PEEP, because by the study conducted or published by Pandari Pande and colleagues, they did find that the, the relationship between the SF ratio and the P ratio was not uh, very much altered by the application of different levels of PEEP. So with regard to the chest x-ray, as you may know, the portable chest x-ray is not uh, quite accessible in different settings, especially in low and middle income countries. And therefore, we did identify that the lung ultrasound can be a very good surrogate to the chest x-ray instead. And we did find out that even the lung ultrasound can even perform better than chest x-ray if applied acco uh, accordingly. From that, we came up with a definition that we have named the Kigali modification uh, of the Berlin definition of the IRDS, where we kept the timing as it is in the Berlin definition, but uh, we try to modify the hypoxemia criteria, uh, replacing the PF ratio by SpO2 FiO2 ratio. As I did say, we did have a cut of the 315 if we take into consideration the linear relationship that has been published by Rice and Correbolators. And then we did exclude the application of the PIP. But for the chest imaging, we did consider the use of the, the lung ultrasound meticulously uh, applied on uh, both sides of the chest at 12 point as described by uh, Lichtenstein in his uh, in her, his several publications and uh, we think that uh, if this definition is applied it can help to uh, at least have an idea on how important is LDS in the settings where the ventilator and the arterial blood gas are not available. Because we did use this modified definition and try to uh, have now an idea on the uh, incidence of the importance of the LDS in the Chigari University Teaching Hospital. And we did find that it was around 4% of all admissions in that hospital, which should have not been possible if we have used the 
Berlin in the fiction because there was no access of the ABG, there was no uh, possibility to have uh, a chest X-ray, especially for very sick patients who were not uh, possible to transport to the radiography or the imaging department. And we think this uh, is a, a call upon for a validation of this uh, tool so that we can have a kind of universally applicable uh, definition of IRDS. And I think if this is uh, proven to be effective, it should raise the importance of the IRDS worldwide because nowadays we don't have no we don't have any uh, epidemiology in the low income country for instance in the in sub saharan africa but also the epidemiology of the IRDS seems to be a little bit disparate where we have uh, very high uh, importance in developed country while the the primary insults that can lead to the LDS are generally more prevalent in uh, resource-limited settings. And by having that definition that is applicable worldwide, we can also expect that uh, different uh, uh, healthcare professionals will uh, adhere to the standard therapeutic evidence that has been proven to uh, improve the quality of care of ARDS patient across the globe. So I would like to thank you for this opportunity that has been given to me to present a little bit on this uh, uh, modified definition and I do expect that uh, setting have access to more standards uh, could help us to uh, uh, validate this uh, tool. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jenny. Uh, so you will take questions after the third talk, as I said previously. So we have to move to the second speaker, who is Antonio Artigas from Spain, We're going to talk about why have all pharmacological treatments failed? Okay. Okay. So, hello, Claude. Uh, I'm in Madrid, uh, so I will try to, uh, in the next minute, min minutes, uh, to present uh, the uh, the why uh, have the all pharmacological treatment fail in RDS. And uh, first of all, I will thanks uh, uh, to be invited to this. Uh, initiative that I think is a, an excellent initiative and and just to congratulate uh, the people that uh, they did uh, this uh, possible. So uh, the previous speaker uh, helped me because uh, I will have the possibility to, uh, to try to cut a little bit my presentation. But uh, these are my relevant disclosures, but they are not related at all with uh, my talk uh, today. And that I will try to do is uh, go uh, to quickly, very quickly, on the diagnosis and definitions, the pathophysiological mechanism of IRDS, uh, why the, pre uh, the, the information of the preclinical models and the prediction of risk stratification, the therapeutic op options. Uh, I will say something uh, very quickly also because it was presented previously on the precise medicine and uh, finally some uh, future directions and uh, cell therapy. Uh, uh, as uh, it was previously mentioned, uh, the uh, Berlin definition is not working at all because if you look on the uh, study from Andres Esteban uh, in, uh, from Getafe, there is only uh, diffuse alveolar damage only in 45% of the cases and you see the, the discrimination power is uh, absolutely very low to predict mortality. So I think that this, uh, we need a, a, a new definition. And the problems because uh, are related to that uh, this definition is not validated. They create confusions 
Uh, and, and the most, for me, the most important, especially uh, related to the treatment, is that they are, this definition is not, and it's a pity, uh, they didn't include uh, any information on the physiological and biological characteristics of IRDS as the permeability, the amount of lung edema, and the presence of uh, pulmonary infl inflammation. So uh, I think this is our, uh, the three key points that uh, uh, they, they should be included uh, in order to uh, determine uh, a more specific treatment in the different patients. Just to give an example, this is uh, from a, a Bellani study, and you see that uh, the uh, areas that are consolidated in the CT scan uh, as the, the lower lobe, and uh, in the uh, right uh, hand you have the PET, uh, the PET uh, uh, image, and you see the infla inflammatory response is lower than those areas that are overinflated as uh, localized in the upper lung. So that means that uh, the, uh, the, the definition, the Berlin definition, uh, is you take, for example, the, uh, the extension of infiltrates and so on, uh, give no, uh, any, any information on the uh, biological uh, response of the lung, especially for lung inflammation. So uh, if we look on the pathophysiological mechanisms, this IRDS is a very complex uh, uh, syndrome uh, and disease uh, where there are many uh, um, cell elements that are playing a key role as the production of fibroblast, uh, the damage of endothelial cells and the epithelial cells, and also the activation of the alveolar macrophage and the activation of the blood coagulation. And, and if you see this picture, uh, you can immediately, uh, do not, you don't need to be very intelligent, that is, this is absolutely very difficult to uh, treat, except if you have a, a, a precise information on which uh, process of these cell process uh, are more activated, and then to decide on a specific treatment. So uh, uh, the, the different treatments uh, first are tested in at the uh, preclinical uh, level, and the problem uh, of that we have today is the limitation of these experimental models. Uh, is very difficult in the preclinical experimental models to reproduce the full complexity of the clinical ARDS. Uh, animals, they don't have uh, pre-existing health conditions. They don't have uh, comorbidities. Uh, normally, we are working with uh, health uh, uh, animals. RDS is a syndrome. It's not a, a specific disease. And the outcome uh, cannot be, uh, many of the outcomes cannot be assessed in the preclinical studies, uh, especially for the long-term outcomes. And the, uh, and Probably is, uh, there is a simplistic extrapolation from the mice uh, to the men, and because there are different genomic uh, signatures. So uh, the message is that there is no model uh, can perfectly imitate or predict the real life, uh, in real life uh, the, the situation of patients with ARDS. So, uh, the, uh, the third factor that uh, probably uh, explains the failure of the uh, different treatment is that uh, uh, RDS is a multi healed uh, model. Uh, you have initially a uh, cause uh, of RDS as sepsis or trauma, but uh, these patients are uh, treated. They have some predisposing, uh, predisposing conditions and genetic factors that will influence on the initial response, but immediately this patient starts uh, to receive a treatment, and uh, this treatment, as a, especially mechanical ventilation, will induce uh, 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 potent or they have the risk uh, to be uh, uh, potential risk uh, in the uh, uh, progression of the disease, and uh, and uh, these are preventable uh, treatment. 
but uh, may uh, influence enormously in the in the picture of the uh, of ARDS patients and uh, patients with uh, uh, is recommended to use uh, a protective mechanical ventilation to restrict the uh, transfusions to have a good uh, management of sepsis and to have a, con a conservative fluid uh, strategies but again I insist uh, uh, this general uh, care is influential uh, enormously in the success of the uh, new treatments that we want to test in, in this disease. And uh, if you go uh, to, uh, through to the recommendations of the famous recommendations of Berlin uh, uh, Task Force, uh, you see there is no, no, uh, any pharmacological treatment in the recommendations. All the recommendations are just to prevent the damage induced by the physicians. But these are not the specific treatments for RDS. If we look on the different treatments uh, that I select uh, for you, uh, come on, uh, as the majority are uh, except for the neuromuscular uh, blockade for the first two days that it seems that decreased mortality but these are trials that should be uh, reconfirmed in uh, new trials all the uh, specific uh, uh, pharmacological uh, treatments fail to demonstrate an improvement in uh, outcome in these patients so one uh, the four uh, reasons probably uh, of uh, the failure of the different uh, pharmacological treatments in IRDS is the uh, alveolar compartmentalization of the inflammatory response. And I like very much uh, this uh, study from Jerome Pugin. He was uh, published many years ago and uh, he was able to demonstrate uh, that the inflammatory response is huge if you look on the alveolar space in the edema fluid and if you compare uh, with the plasma samples. So plasma samples did not uh, uh, indicate you uh, the uh, long uh, inflammatory response that they present uh, patients with ARDS. And this I think is a, is a, is a very important uh, point. And, uh, and this was also the rationale uh, to start uh, for, uh, to uh, local treatment by, uh, by nebulization or by inhalation. Uh, and this is uh, one of the examples, nebulizing heparin. Heparin is a very cheap uh, drug uh, that uh, heparin uh, was able to decrease the time of mechanical ventilation in uh, patients uh, or in, uh, at the preclinical level uh, on uh, models with acute lung injury induced by uh, sepsis. So uh, just coming back uh, as the previous speaker, uh, I think uh, uh, it's important uh, to consider uh, in the future uh, the, uh, to personalize uh, the treatments in, the pa in patients with ARDS and identifying the different subphenotypes uh, e to analyze the different uh, therapeutic response and uh, to look on the deregulation, the deregulation of the immune response. And uh, as the previous speaker shows you, uh, the uh, uh, the Caroline Calfi uh, published uh, uh, recently uh, uh, differentiating two groups, uh, the, uh, the patients with ARDS with uh, uh, high uh, inflammatory response and those that they have an, uh, a decrease of inflammatory response. And, uh, and this was uh, determined by some uh, biomarkers with uh, uh, an excellent uh, discrimi uh, discrimination power and, uh, and indicating that uh, uh, we cannot treat all the patients uh, uh, with the same treatment. Uh, just, to, just to show you that uh, the, the two different phenotypes uh, identified by uh, Carolyn Calfi in this study, you can see that uh, the mortality rate in the subphenotype in the subphenotype 1 
it was only 21% if you compare uh, to the mortality rate in the true phenotype uh, 2, that it was uh, much higher of uh, 44%. And finally, I think uh, there is a new area uh, of, uh, to consider, and there is uh, different studies uh, at the pre based on the preclinical uh, data, and now uh, uh, they start to do some uh, studies uh, on cell therapy. The uh, rationale of the cell therapy uh, is based on uh, the preclinical data, and uh, that is a, a treatment that is able to impact or to the uh, to modify or uh, the in uh, at the different levels of the mechanism uh, of uh, acute lung injury. Uh, they are able to increase the phagocytosis, uh, to increase uh, the endothelial and epithelial repair. Uh, uh, the uh, cell therapy uh, using the mesenchymal cells uh, is able to, uh, to modulate uh, the inflammatory response and to increase the, the uh, alveolar uh, edema, pulmonary edema reabsorption. So, uh, mm -hmm. let me check, uh, yeah. So, what would be uh, the future? I think the future is uh, to try to uh, uh, build uh, an informatic system. Uh, I, I say this is the acute lung injury chip, uh, considering the clinical uh, data and uh, as a gas exchange, airway, the long mechanics, and the regional volume changes. In addition, with the uh, laboratory uh, data that indicate uh, uh, the biological changes and the, pa the different pathways that are predominant in the different uh, patients. According to this, then you can stratify and define much better your uh, patient and stratify. Uh, uh, these uh, different patients, the, the patients with IRDS, and then uh, to have a more precise and personalized uh, recommendations to treat uh, these patients. Uh, I think uh, in the future uh, we need uh, more uh, precise and accurate uh, biomarkers to identify soon these patients, and also uh, to potentiate in the future uh, the local treatment by uh, different uh, uh, pharmacological treatment by inhalation uh, in these patients. And with that, uh, I think uh, I finish my presentation and I'm uh, open to for any uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks again to the organizers for the um, opportunity to uh, speak. I'm going to quickly go over um, guidelines that we published this year on the use of mechanical ventilation in adult patients with ARDS. Um, this is the publication that appeared in the Blue Journal earlier this year. And just again to highlight that it was uh, uh, a tr an effort that uh, included many um, professionals across um, many different countries in the world and is a guideline that was endorsed by the American Thoracic Society, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, as well as the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Um, we tried to answer six questions, and I'm gonna go over briefly those questions. The first was um, the use of lower tidal volumes and inspiratory pressures. Um, and again, just to preface for the group that we followed rigorous methodologic guidelines for the creation of these um, recommendations, which was the grade process. So somewhat constrained by the by examining randomized controlled trials to inform the evidence that would lead to clinical recommendations in these patients. Um, so for lower tidal volume ventilation, there were nine randomized trials of just over 1,600 patients. On average, comparing tidal volumes about 7 mils per kilo versus 11 mils per kilo. And for all our analyses to avoid confounding, we only looked at trials where the intervention that we were examining wasn't uh, combined with some other therapy. Um, so for instance, for this one, we tried to exclude trials that were combined with higher PEEP. And in the primary analysis, mortality was not significantly different between low tidal volume versus traditional strategies. 
in seven studies with a relative risk of 0.87. We had moderate confidence in these uh, results. However, we did a number of other pre-specified analyses, including meta-regression, that showed an important dose-response relationship between trials that had a larger difference between higher and lower tidal volumes and mortality, and this was significant, suggesting that trials where the difference between tidal volumes um, were associated with lower mortality, i.e. those that lower tidal volumes more had a stronger association with mortality. And there was also a sensitivity analysis that included the trials with the higher peak Pointer mentions that showed a consistent signal that lower tidal volume ventilation seemed to be associated with a mortality benefit. So based on these results, we um, recommended that adult patients with ARDS receive mechanical ventilation with strategies that limit tidal volumes to four to eight mils per kilo predicted body weight and inspiratory pressures with keeping a plateau pressure below 30 centimeters of water. And again, based on the grade structure, um, this led to a strong recommendation um, based on the moderate confidence we had in the effect, effect estimates from the systematic review. Um, the way we justified this recommendation was that although there was no significant difference in mortality in the primary analysis, the boundary of the confidence interval was consistent with a plausible effect suggesting that low tidal volume ventilation could reduce mortality. Um, we we're also um, buoyed by the fact that now in many different settings, it seems that low tidal volume ventilation seems to be beneficial in the intraoperative and the perioperative amongst patients who don't have ARDS yet. And again, also the idea that meta-regression and our sensitivity analyses were consistent with a clinically important benefit and showed a dose-response relationship suggesting a potential causal relationship. Um, and then in implementing this recommendation, the initial tidal volume should be set at six mils per kilo and can be liberalized up to eight mils per kilo if the patient is showing signs of distress or asynchrony, such as double triggering, or if inspiratory airway pressures decrease below peak. The second uh, recomm recommendation is around prone positioning. And again, here we had eight randomized control trials of just over 2,000 patients. Again, the primary analysis that excluded confounding studies showed really no significant difference in mortality when you took all comers ARDS, and there's a relative risk of 0.84. Um, however, in a number of pre-specified subgroup analyses, we found significantly reduced mortality amongst those patients who had prone duration of more than 12 hours per day, as well as those that had more severe hypoxemia, and again here classified by the Berlin definition, those having moderate or severe ARDS. Um, we also considered a number of well-designed and conducted individual patient data meta-analyses that were published before our own study-level meta-analyses. And these, again, also showed a consistent signal that there was lower mortality in those patients that had more severe ARDS. Um, and that was subsequently confirmed in the landmark PROCEVA study, where the included patients had a mean PAO2 to FIO2 ratio of about 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, importantly, other side effects, prone positioning was associated with significantly higher rates of endotracheal tube obstruction and pressure sores, and there was no difference in barotrauma. So based on these results, we recommend that adult patients with severe ARDS receive prone positioning for more than 12 hours a day. Uh, again, based on the data, this was a strong recommendation where we had moderate to high confidence in the effect estimate as per the grade um, uh, guidelines. I guess the important thing to be transparent about is that not all the members of the panel agreed with this strong recommendation. Some um, um, canvassed for a conditional recommendation for the use of prone positioning in patients with severe ARDS. And some of the concerns by those panel members were that um, our results were based mainly on a subgroup analysis heavily weighted by the single large randomized controlled trial, PROCEVA. And again, that these potential risks of endotracheal tube obstruction, pressure ulcers, increased sedation, and limited mobilization in the prone position um, weigh on the uh, potential benefits that may be accrued with prone positioning. Um, and then we also had a lack of consensus. Uh, you saw Dr. Ortigas' uh, modified picture from the Berlin definition of extending the prone positioning out to about a PF ratio of 150, as was the original inclusion criteria of PROCEVA. We didn't have any consensus among the panel providing even a conditional recommendation for prone positioning in patients with moderate ARDS. Again, this was thought based mainly on inclusion criteria from PROCEVA. And again, due to the lower confidence in the balance between desirable as compared to undesirable outcomes, we, we didn't make a recommendation for moderate ARDS patients. Uh, for high-frequency oscillatory ventilation, 
Here we had six randomized control trials of just over 1,700 patients. Again, we excluded trials that used core interventions or didn't have um, lung protective ventilation in the control group. Uh, in the three studies included, there was no significant difference in mortality, although you see the relative risk estimate is on the side of um, no benefit or even harm. And we had high confidence in this result. And we strongly considered, um, at the time the guideline panel convened, the publication of two large randomized uh, multicenter trials, both the Oscillate study and OSCAR, one that really showed no benefit, the OSCAR study, but the other, the Oscillate study that showed perhaps a signal towards harm. And so putting these trials together with our meta-analysis, we recommended that HFO be not be used routinely in patients with moderate to severe ARDS. And again, based mainly on the two large um, trials, but this was a strong recommendation with moderate to high confidence and effect estimates. And again, we are very much the panel weighed uh, by the results of Oscillate and Oscar, which we felt were um, um, studies that were done with modern control groups, uh, although the Oscar trial was more pragmatic in design. Again, that the Oscillate study reported significant harm while the other showed no benefit. And again, just to highlight that following the publication of our guideline, there's been a recent individual patient data meta-analysis um, by, um, by the groups that uh, ran these RCTs against suggesting that for all comers, there really is no benefit of high frequency oscillation, but that if you look um, in a pre-specified analysis, there may be a role for rescue therapy in severe ARDS in patients with refractory hypoxemia and to be maximally conservative in looking at where the upper confidence interval for this effect uh, is below one, you might consider the use of HFOB in patients whose PF ratio is less than 64 millimeters of mercury. Higher versus lower P. Randomized control trials, 2,700 patients, comparing a PEEP on average of 15 versus 9. Um, again, we excluded trials that didn't use low tidal volume ventilation in the lower PEEP groups. Again, when looking at these studies, um, there was no significant difference in mortality, although the point estimate, again, is on the side of benefit for higher PEEP, but that was not significant. And we didn't find in other sort of secondary outcomes any significant differences in barrel trauma, new organ failures, or ventilator-free days. Uh, but again, here we had, prior to our own study level meta-analysis, a very high quality individual patient data meta-analysis of the three large RCTs, that would be LOVES, ALVEOLI, and the EXPRESS trials, looking at higher versus lower PEEP. Um, and again, in this individual patient data meta-analysis, there was significantly lower mortality um, in the moderate to severe group, so those with more severe hypoxemia, and this interaction was significant. And there didn't seem to be a very um, uh, uh, positive effect of higher levels of PEEP in patients with mild ARDS. In fact, the point estimate was on the side of potential um, harm. So based on these results, we suggest that adult patients with moderate or severe ARDS receive higher rather than lower levels of PEEP. And again, this is a conditional recommendation based on some heterogeneity in the results. So this is a suggest rather than recommend. We have moderate confidence in the effect estimate and again, we were heavily weighing the data from the individual patient data meta-analysis, supporting reduction in those with more severe uh, hypoxemia. In terms of operationalizing this recommendation, multiple different strategies were used in the large randomized control trials. So a reasonable starting point in applying higher levels of PEEP in patients with moderate or severe RDS would include using one of the strategies that was employed in these trials, such as the ones in alveoli loves or express. Recruitment maneuvers, six randomized control trials here. Again, we excluded um, trials that used higher PEEP as a core intervention. Unfortunately, when you exclude trials that use combined recruitment maneuvers with higher PEEP, there was only one um, randomized study in China of just 110 patients that did show a benefit for mortality. But when you look in a secondary analysis, including all the trials, there still seemed to be a signal showing an improvement uh, in mortality with um, recruitment maneuvers. I might just say that, of course, this recommendation was crafted before the publication of the recent ART trial at JAMA. Uh, these results may be slightly different now, uh, given the uh, nature of those results. Um, again, we didn't find any heterogeneity despite the higher peak core intervention. Recruitment maneuvers were associated with some surrogate benefits like higher oxygenation, reduced leap rescue therapies, without any difference in barrel trauma or rates of hemodynamic compromise. So again, Pre-ART trial, we suggested based on the evidence that we adult patients with moderate or severe RDS could receive recruitment maneuvers. Again, a conditional recommendation given the low moderate confidence in effect estimates. 
Um, part of the challenge of this recommendation is that, of course, these studies employed all different kinds of recruitment maneuvers, um, and most had a higher PEEP uh, strategy as a co-intervention. Um, and the rates of hemodynamic compromise differed considerably between trials. So again, weighing the data that we looked at and now perhaps slightly different in light of more recent trial results, clinicians should be cautious about using recruitment maneuvers, particularly in those with pre-existing hypovolemia or shock. Finally, our last um, question was looking at the use of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO. Um, and here, as you're probably aware, there was only a single modern randomized control trials, the CSER study, looking at 180 patients. And again, the primary outcome there was a composite of uh, survival without disability. But when looking just at mortality, there was no significant difference in mortality for those transferred for the ECMO versus those not transferred receiving conventional ventilation. Um, and a secondary analysis incorporating a number of higher quality observational studies also found no significant difference in mortality, eight studies, just over 1,100 patients. Um, importantly, there didn't seem to be a significant number, a significant difference in groups in life-threatening bleeding as a complication of being on EV ECMO. And so based, basic, based on just the one randomized trial, which showed no significant difference and a number of caveats to the results of the CSER study, we could not make a recommendation on the use of ECMO for patients with severe ARDS and we need additional evidence. We might suggest that those groups that are using um, ECMO on an ongoing basis for ARDS um, help contribute to ongoing research to understand where its role might be for patients with ARDS. Um, and again, the idea here that they're just with the one RCT, there's insufficient data to make a recommendation. And the CSER trial had a number of important limitations, again, including the use of a competent primary outcome, incomplete application of the intervention. What you might recall that 25% of patients transferred to Lester for ECMO actually never got ECMO. There was a lack of standardized uh, lung protective ventilation in the control group, as this was a pragmatic study. And again, the important co-intervention here of transfer to a high volume referral center. Uh, for the guideline in general, future, future iterations may include some of the treatments that Dr. Atigas uh, mentioned, including things like neuromuscular blockade, particularly after uh, the reevaluation of the ROSE uh, trial that's ongoing in the United States, other adjunctive measures and other modes of mechanical ventilation. Uh, but again, a guideline is only a guideline. It's a starting point, and clinicians should consider the patient in front of them and uh, personalize decisions for them and be careful when comparing the relative benefits of one intervention over the other. Um, these are not specifically um, been compared in head-to-head -head, um, trials, sort of any combinations or synergies between interventions. Um, and most, although most recent studies of uh, these kinds of ventilatory interventions have used some kind of low tidal volume ventilations. And again, as we've seen, a, a good example being the PRT trial that's published in JAMA, these guidelines require constant updating. And uh, again, the idea here that at least the recruitment maneuver um, recommendation might be uh, quite different now based on the results of that recent trial. I just want to acknowledge again the very large group of um, uh, investigators and clinicians that provided their time and expertise in the creation of these uh, guidelines, as well as um, support from the ATS, ESICM, and SECM for these uh, efforts. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eddie. So I, have, I, I would like to take the floor to, to Elisa and then to Pablo before the questions have been taken. Okay, hello. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm Elisa Estensoro from La Plata, Argentina. And, well, thank you very much for this very exciting format to which we are not used to, but probably the future will be this. And first, well, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Fan something because you um, have mentioned the Brazilian trial, the ART trial, in relation to um, recruitment man maneuvers. But really, these recruitment maneuvers were used just to titrate PIP. And in that trial, the, the group that received recruitment maneuvers ended with higher PIP, of course. And what do you think? Because you, you ascribe the higher mortality to the use of, of recruitment maneuvers, but maybe that the, um, the recommendation about high PIP may change also in the guidelines. Because really, what did they, why did these patients die more? Because of recruitment maneuvers that were transient 
or because of the higher fees that finance services day after day? That's my question. Okay, so th thank you for that question. Oh, that's, that's a very good <laughs> question. Um, and of course, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, perhaps I was a bit um, cavalier to say that it would be the recruitment maneuver recommendation that would change. We've actually had some back and forth debate with Carol Hodgson, who uh, is very interested in the idea of recruitment and recruitment maneuvers, and she's updating a Cochrane meta-analysis to consider these new data as to whether it really is a change in um, outcome because of recruitment maneuvers, or really is this is a trial of higher peak, as you mentioned, where the recruitment maneuver is really a intervention to help set or help recognize what level of peep should be set. And of course, it's going to depend on whether you're a lumper or a splitter, but this is a package intervention. It's going to be impossible to know how to attribute the mortality that's seen in this study, whether how much of it is to a recruitment maneuver, how much it is to um, um, higher levels of peep. Um, so I guess philosophically, at least, it really depends on whether you ascribe the concept of you know, recruitability and maintaining recruitment in this trial to be mainly the result of the recruitment maneuver or mainly the result of the peak, or it's really impossible to know. So I think, um, not trying to evade your question, I guess it's uh, some people might consider the former, some might consider the latter, um, but it is a point for, uh, for discussion. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Mia, do you have a question? Pablo, do you, would you like to ask some question? So this was yes. to Antonio. Yes. This was to Antonio. And uh, because we, well, we didn't mention what we are all thinking about, theory. And what do you think about theory and their ideas? Because we see meta-analysis and they are composed by trials from the same group, but meta-analysis seems, seems to to say that uh, steroids work in AR ideas. Notwithstanding this, they're not much use. What is your personal point of view about this? Well, uh, if, I'm, if I am Umberto Meduri, I will say yes. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, but uh, seriously, uh, just to answer to you, uh, I think uh, corticosteroids in low doses of corticosteroids in a later phase of IRDS is not absolute, is not indicated. There is no positive results. The uh, small doses and uh, that should be maintained during a minimum of seven days can uh, be used uh, in an uh, early phase of IRDS as uh, the recent uh, uh, analysis of uh, the different studies done by Umberto Meduri uh, shows that uh, you need to maintain the, the treatment during uh, some days uh, in order to prevent the rebound effect uh, if you stop too early uh, the corticosteroids. But remember also that corticosteroids, you are paying something. Uh, uh, it's not uh, a completely safe uh, treatment. And... Uh, Something that uh, we need to explore in the future is uh, the uh, use of corticosteroids uh, by inhalation because uh, probably uh, the potential a adverse events if you are doing by inhalation uh, will be less and you will uh, probably concentrate or you can be more efficacy uh, controlling or modulating uh, the uh, alveolar uh, pulmonary in inflammation. And, and I think this is uh, an area that uh, we need to explore. Uh, there is a, and finally, there is uh, two recent uh, studies, one uh, on uh, oral corticosteroids in patients uh, without ARDS, uh, and, uh, and then they develop an ARDS. I mean, it seems that uh, oral corticosteroids uh, decrease the, the, the risk uh, to develop an ARDS. And uh, this is a recent paper that appeared uh, soon. And, and also the combination of uh, corticosteroids with uh, beta-2 agonist, uh, that it seems that uh, improve uh, gas exchange during the first uh, five days. 
uh, this is uh, the information that we have. Uh, and uh, if uh, you ask me a recommendation, I will, s I will uh, uh, probably summarize that uh, you can use uh, corticosteroids in small doses uh, during uh, a minimum of uh, five or seven days in small doses uh, in those patients that you have uh, a persistent inflammatory response during the early phase of IRDS, but not in the later phase. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. I have a question from a colleague here. Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Luis Córdoba, soy intensivista. Eh, espero que no sea un problema hablar en español. It is not a question, it is rather a comment or a reflection. When we inform families of the patients that are having a distress and we tell them that the lung is inflamed or inflammated and the family asks us what is the treatment to be applied and we say to them that the lung has to heal by itself and we have to wait. We've been doing this for 20 years, more or less. This is the time that I've been working on this field. And we don't have any further therapeutical weapon or targeted weapon that we could present to the families. Even if uh, during in these debates or discussions we speak about uh, the future and perspectives, there is nothing new. Uh, there's nothing new for years. I don't know if there is something that we do not know, and it's maybe in the m earliest phases or stages, and we uh, could I, I comment on this. Uh, there is some uh, treatment, uh, but uh, they are I still uh, uh, ongoing, uh, so we need to wait. Uh, as, for example, all the strategies using uh, uh, mesenchymal cells or or, for example, using uh, uh, alveolar type 2 cells uh, that are uh, more differentiated cells and uh, they, are, they are acting uh, in two different uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, this is, uh, there are uh, some trials that are uh, ongoing and we need to, to wait. Um, there is uh, also uh, an ongoing uh, uh, well, there are preclinical data and uh, and phase two and phase one, and uh, they are trying now to do a phase two study with uh, inhalation of uh, uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, that I think this is uh, an, a new treatment that we need to to wait uh, for for results, uh, uh, especially in the, with the phase two study in in patients, and also there are some. Uh, there, is an, uh, there are some new proteins uh, that are uh, trying to uh, uh, give uh, to the patients by inhalation uh, to promote uh, the uh, pulmonary edema reabsorption as the uh, uh, AP301, uh, that uh, there are some uh, data from the phase two studies and there is a new study on the phase two and phase three study and we need to, to wait uh, for the results. Uh, that is, uh, that I know, uh, there is also an interferon study that uh, is uh, going on, is not uh, already finished, uh, conducted uh, by, uh, by a group uh, in, in UK, and, uh, and I think uh, there are some promising uh, uh, new strategies, but I insist uh, that uh, because of the complexity of IRDS, we need uh, uh, to consider two points that I think is, uh, are very important. First is that IRDS patients are fragile patients that cannot tolerate uh, two uh, important adverse events. And secondly, uh, uh, IRDS is an uh, inhomogeneous uh, lung damage. Uh, that means that uh, we need uh, to develop uh, treatments uh, that uh, give a high concentration of this, uh, um, uh, uh, this new treatment in the lung. And uh, there are only two possibilities uh, for the future. Uh, one is to use uh, liposomes, uh, for example, the endothelial liposomes uh, to, to have uh, 
a high concentration of the different uh, uh, drugs uh, in the lung and uh, the cell therapy. Uh, probably these are uh, the two strategies that are focused uh, acting in the different uh, cell uh, elements in the lung that are contributing enormously in the uh, lung inflammation uh, in ARDS patients. May, may I uh, may may ask uh, you a question, Eddie? Uh, because uh, you 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 presented uh, the recommendations of uh, the task force on ARDS, but uh, this task force did not include anything about uh, the patients at risk of ARDS or patients with mild ARDS that I I consider that are not really ARDS patients. Do you think that the mechanical ventilation strategies in these patients, in the less severe patients, should be different as in the, if you compare with the moderate or severe patients? Um, yeah, so I think uh, one of the reasons why um, there wasn't a focus on at-risk at patients, for instance, uh, is that uh, just logistical, like the guideline process has to play out over a short amount of time and there's only a limited amount of resources to answer a certain number of questions so we tried to limit it to six so the first reason we didn't consider other interventions or other modes of mechanical ventilation or other populations like at-risk patients for that reason um, we did consider mild you know by berlin definition ARDS patients because the guideline looked at those six interventions in all populations in which they were studied um, and i agree that it seems the bulk of the interventions um, the benefit seems concentrated in the sicker patients, the moderate or severe. I might just say that at least for the low tidal volume ventilation um, intervention, that seems to be a intervention that is beneficial across um, all groups irrespective of severity. And again, one of the reasons the panel considered a strong recommendation there is also the available data I think you're alluding to um, looking at active or lower tidal volume ventilation in intraoperative patients and surgical patients at thoracic or abdominal surgery. Um, the work by Marcus Schultz and the PROVE group showing that, you know, that it also seems to be beneficial in patients who are at risk for ARDS. So I think that data at least peripherally influenced our decision to make a strong recommendation for low tidal volume ventilation. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, may I ask uh, a question uh, to Claude Guerin, uh, the chairman of this session? Claude? Yeah. yeah uh, you know that uh, your paper is, uh, was recently approved uh, on uh, the, uh, this is a, a study to, uh, uh, to see how is uh, prompt position used in, uh, in different ICUs, uh, mainly in Europe. Uh, can you say something about uh, the results of this or comment why the people are not using prompt position as uh, a first uh, treatment in patients uh, with uh, moderate and especially in patients with severe ARDS? Okay, uh, thank you, Antonio, for this question. So actually, we've, we completed a, a study about uh, uh, a single prevalence day repeated four times about the, the use of prone position uh, in ARDS patients uh, during one year, over 141 ICU, mostly in Europe, but also in North and South America, and in, um, in China, also in, in Eastern Europe. And we found that in uh, the first uh, interesting point, that the, the, the rate of use of prone position was similar across the four uh, study days, and uh, it was twice higher uh, in, in the most severe ARDS patients than in the lung safe study. We, we used uh, a prone position in, let's say, 33% of the patients with severe ARDS versus 16 in the lung safe study, uh, which could indicate either a BIA selection in our uh, study or really uh, 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 an improvement, a change in practice. 
So regarding the, 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 the main reason for the clinician to not use uh, prone positioning was uh, the hypoxemia that was judged as not severe enough. And indeed, there was the cutoff was really uh, at 120 millimeter of mercury. Um, and uh, the, it was really the, the most frequent reason. The second was a, a doubt about a hemodynamic uh, adverse event due to the prone positioning. Uh, okay. okay. I, I know that we are very short from time, but I would like to ask a very quick, quick question to Dr. Teogen Tauringa. Okay. Dr. Tauringa. Teoger? Yeah. Okay. I, are you listening to me? Yeah. Okay, great. I guess your show was incredible. I really, I think you you make a great advance in ARDS. And you mentioned the classic study from Calfe in which she said that several subtypes exist. I wonder if you're going, uh, sorry, I guess the, the main result from, from Calfe is the demonstration that exists exist a latent variable that explains that cl clusterization. I wonder if, I wonder if in, in your database or in your study, you are going to test how many patients diagnosed with your new definition of ARDS really has DID. Thanks. You mean the, the the new definition with the SpO2 FiO2 ratio? Uh, no, no, not the SpO2 ratio. If you have, for example, pathological result from your patient, autopsies or something similar. Doctor Tebor, or your study is only with clinical variable and you are not, you don't have pathological results? No, no. And again, the, the, the study by Calfi and Femas, where they use the latent class analysis, uh, they use uh, inflammatory biomarkers, other bio biological markers, so which are not. Uh, accessible in our settings so, and again using the latent class analysis uh, without those different uh, markers to try to demarcate the different cases of ILDS in our database could not be feasible nowadays okay thank you You're welcome. any questions from the from the panelist Um, Not from here. Okay. Uh, I, I have a, a question for... Sorry, I have a question for Tio Jenny, uh, Muga, about the, the validation of your definition in the, uh, in the rich countries, as you said. Um, in, in your definition, one of criterion was not using PEEP. Yeah. Uh, do you think this is something that can be accepted by, uh, you know, the, the community of intensivists in patients receiving mechanical ventilation, or it just in patients not mechanically ventilated you would like to, to, to use this criterion? I think we can use that one on patient till they get mechanically ventilated, but uh, Again, there was a study that has been conducted by Caironi and colleagues that has been published in Critical Care uh, Medicine in 2015. They were trying to see if uh, the PEEP was uh, uh, able to discriminate the 
diagnosis of ARDS among patients, the, 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 the result is that the P per se does need to participate in diagnosing patients with ARDS, but it can uh, maybe discriminate between uh, mild, moderate, and severe patients with ARDS, but it does not exclude, if not applied, it does not exclude that uh, patients are not having ARDS. So, I think to be able to have a good tool that can be used in resource-limited settings, we can uh, aim at uh, applying this proposed definition on patients who are uh, going to be put on uh, mechanical ventilation they have before they get the PEEP, and then compare the results once the patient have had the PEEP. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. How, how, are you using uh, high flow oxygen uh, cannula? Unfortunately, we don't have yet the high flow oxygen in our settings, but uh, maybe in the future we'll see if we can get it and see how it may, if it may make a difference in that yeah. particular kind of patient. Yeah. Because you know, with this, with this method, you have, you have some people, let's say, a sweet and five uh, centimeter of water. Yeah. Uh, uh, Claude, uh, may I ask you uh, when the 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 criteria should be applied uh, at the admission of the ICU, or you need to wait uh, for 24 hours or 12 hours of treatment, as it was demonstrated by Jesus Villar and recently by the group of Amsterdam of Mark Schulz, that there yeah. is patients that they improve uh, after 12 or 24 hours and they are not still uh, be an ARDS because probably are more uh, collapse uh, areas and but not uh, long inflammation. So do you think that the concept of persistent ARDS is an important one? Uh, I, I will say uh, rather than persistent, I will say something like confirm because the term persistent refers mostly to patients still in ARDS after, let's say, one week. But in, in the situation you are describing, maybe we are, first we don't know. There is a very limited information about the pathophysiology of those patients who, who are going to either improve or worsen or stabilize over the first 24 days, uh, hours. So maybe we are just selecting clinically a subset of patients who may have not ERDS or are very prone to improve rapidly. Maybe there was uh, hydrostatic factors or something. We, we don't really have, we have a very limited uh, description of those patients in my, in my view, I guess. I would like I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we don't have enough time. Ah, Claude, okay. could you finish the session, please? Okay. Okay, so uh, we have to close the session, that's what you are saying, Pablo? Yes, Professor, please, we, are, we, we don't have more time. Okay, so I would like to thank very much, uh, Pablo, for your energy to conduct this, uh, this day, this event. And I would like to thank very much the three speakers for their outstanding talk. Uh, I learned a lot during this, uh, during this event. Thank you so much and have a nice evening.